This is the third video on our road to the RSA encryption algorithm, and it's part of the discrete math course at Harvard Mudd College. We're going to be following this book right over here, and today we're going to talk about linear Diophantine equations. So what we're going to do is if you give an integer a, an integer b, and an integer c, we're going to decide whether or not there are integer solutions to an equation like this for x and y, and if there are integer solutions, then what's the full set of integer solutions altogether? So I want to start our exploration with these three examples. Let's look at this first one. Do we have integer solutions to this equation at all? Well, if we did, then this here would be a multiple of 8, and this would be a multiple of 8, so their sum is a multiple of 8. Um, but this is not a multiple of 8, so that would be a problem. So there's no way this is a solution whatsoever. Okay, so... A principle we're learning here is that if d is a number that divides this and d divides this, then d would have to divide this integer combination, meaning it has to divide this right-hand side. In particular, if we pick d to be the GCD of these two numbers, then it would divide both these quantities and consequently have to divide this. So if we hope for a solution, this thing on the right-hand side better be a multiple of the GCD of the two numbers a and B in general. Okay, so let's write that down as a necessary condition. All right, so for a solution to exist, we need to have that the GCD of these two numbers divides the right-hand side. All right, maybe there is more that's needed. Let's take a look. So let's look at this example here. 3x plus 4y is 8. Now there are many ways you could go about this. You could say, oh, well, 4 divides 8, so we can make this 4 times 2 and then make this 0. That's a good way to guess. But if these numbers get quite large, that's not sort of a systematic way to go about this. Um, so one thing we do know is that the GCD of 3 and 4 is 1. That's the greatest common factor that they have in common. So by last video, which was Bezu's lemma, it tells us that the GCD of these two numbers can be written as an integer combination of the two. In particular, we can write it like this. And now we can use that to figure out a solution to this. If we write multiply the right-hand side by 8, we can also multiply these quantities by 8 and get an equality here. So if we take 3 times negative 8 plus 4 times 8, we'll get 8. By that argument then, if the GCD of A and B divides C, then that's kind of like the situation we have here, the GCD of 3 and 4 divides 8. We can write the GCD as an integer combination of 3 and 4, and then multiply through to get 8 as an integer combination of 3 and 4. So it seems like this condition is also sufficient, meaning that if we have this, then we get a solution. So it seems like this condition is the complete condition needed in order to determine whether or not we have a solution to this equation for integers x and y. Let's run through a more complicated example, this last one right over here, to actually see that's the case by looking at the GCD of these two numbers, writing it as an integer combination of these two numbers like we did in the last video, and then using that to find a solution for this equation. Okay, so the way this worked was we take the first number 21, and we divide by 15 and get a remainder, and the remainder in this case is 6. Then we continue this process with this dividend and the remainder here. So 15 is 2 times 6 plus 3. And then finally, we do this with these two. We get 6 is 2 times 3. And so the Euclidean algorithm tells us that this last remainder is the GCD of the two numbers that she originally started with. And that makes sense. The greatest common divisor between these two is 3. Now, to write 3 as an integer combination of these two, we worked this backwards. We said 3, then, is 15 times 1 minus or plus uh, 6 times negative 2. And we can replace this 6 with 21 minus 15 from the previous line. So we get 15 times 1 plus 21 minus 15 times this negative 2. And then if we expand, we get 21 times negative 2 plus 15 times, we have a 1 copy and then a negative, negative 2, so that gives us a total of 3. So there's our integer combination. 
we have that 21 times negative 2 plus 15 times 3 is 3. Okay, great. So a good review of what we did before. And now that we have this solution, to get a solution for this equation, we'd have to multiply by 3. So we get 21 times negative 6 plus 15 times 9 is 9. And there's our integer solution pair, negative 6 and 9. Cool. Okay, so it seems like this is necessary and sufficient, meaning if we have this, we get a solution, and if you have a solution, we get this. So let's actually write that as an actual theorem and give a concrete proof, mimicking exactly the things that we just did before. All right, so this theorem is theorem 8 in our book, and it states that if you have these two, three positive integers, a, b, and c, and you're trying to solve the linear e d fancy equation ax plus by equals c for the variables x and y, then there's an integer solution, a specific one, if and only if the GCD of A and B divides C. Now, again, the proof process is going to mimic exactly what we saw in the examples. So we need to prove two things. One is that if you have a solution, then the GCD of AB divides C. And if the, the GCD of AB divides C, you have a solution. Okay, so we'll start with the forward direction, assuming that you have a particular solution. Okay, so we have ax naught plus by naught equals c. All right, so for simplicity throughout the proof, what I'll do is I'll let d be the GCD of a and b. All right, so if we want to prove that d divides c, that's our goal, well, we know d divides a and d divides b because d is the GCD of them. And this is an integer combination, so d has to divide this whole thing. And that gives us that d divides c. All right, so let's write that in words. So since d divides a and d divides b, d divides this integer combination ax plus not plus by not, so d divides c. So we could go through the rigorous process of proving that these two imply this, we actually did that in an earlier video, so I'll leave that alone. Okay, great, so now let's go through the other process of proving that this implies this. So now we have the GCD of A and B divides C, we wanna solve this equation here. And what we did last time is we first solved for X and Y where we replaced C by D, and D here being the GCD of these numbers, and we got a solution by using Bezu's lemma. And then, we multiplied by what we needed to to get C on the right-hand side. So that's exactly what we're going to do here. So by Bezu's lemma, uh, there are integers. Let's call them, we don't want them to be x0, y0. That's the solution we're going to find. So maybe let's call them uh, x1 and y1, such that ax1 plus by1 equals d. Okay, so now if we want to make this right hand a c, we need to multiply throughout by c over d. And we can change the solution accordingly. So a1 times x1 times c over d plus b times y1 times c over d is going to equal d times c over d because we multiply by c over d throughout, which is c. So if you want to find our particular solution to this equation, we kind of have it staring at us right here. Um, set x naught to x1 times c over d and y naught to y1 times c over d. Since c over d is an integer, because d divides c, um, these are integers. And that's exactly what we wanted. We wanted an integer solution to our equation. So this is a really nice theorem proof because what it does is it takes our examples and actually does exactly what our examples did, just write it out in general form. Okay, great, so now we have a complete characterization of when a solution exists. So our next question is, when we do have a solution, how do we know what all solutions are? 
Let's take a look at an example to see. Okay, so the motivating example that I want to use is this one right over here. 18x plus 30y is 66. So the first thing I want to do is change this somewhat. Um, so the, we know that for a solution to even exist at all, the GCD of these two has to divide this. So let's pretend that we ran the Euclidean algorithm on this already. If you do, you'll get the GCD of these two numbers right over here is 6, and 6 does divide 66. Now, if you actually run the algorithm, you would get that 18 times 2 plus 30 times negative 1 is 6. And so, a solution to this can be obtained by multiplying this by 11, which gives us the one solution, xy equals 22, negative 11. Okay, so now that we know by the Euclidean algorithm of the GCD6, what I'll do is something that's slightly different in the book, which is divide by 6 throughout. So here we'll get 3x, and then we'll get 5y is 11. And so this is the equation we're trying to find out all solutions to. And we already have one solution, which is 22, negative 11. It still works for this because it worked for this, and we just divided this by 6. Okay, so how do we find all the solutions to this where x and y are actually integers? Okay, so if you graph this in the xy plane, we would get a line that looks something like this, with this point 22, negative 11 somewhere. So I'm going to extend this line a little bit. And pretend it's like over here. So here's 22, negative 11. So what do other points on this line look like? Well, this line, if we rearranged, when we look at what happens when you move along this line, because the slope is negative 3 fifths, any point here can be written as 22, negative 11 plus movement of 5 in this direction and a movement of 3 in this direction scaled by some factor. Right, and here we'd have our movement being negative. So we'd have something like t times negative 5, 3. And this is the parametric form of a line. So every single point on this line can be represented in this way. So our question is, for which values of t are both coordinates here integers? Well, this is something with integer coordinates. So the only way this whole thing has integer coordinates is if this thing here does. So we'd need both negative 5t and 3t to be integers. If t is an integer, then both of these are integers. And if both of these are integers, then actually t is forced to be an integer. And the reason is because the GCD of 5 and 3 is 1. So we can write 1 as an integer combination of 5 and 3. Let's say we write it as uh, 5 times negative 1 plus 3 times 2. And so as a consequence, t can be written as an integer combination of these two. If we multiply this by t, we can write this as negative 5t times 1 plus 3t times 2. Right? And so if these two are both integers, then t has to be an integer. Okay, so let's recap. For this whole thing to be an integer, this piece has to be an integer, which happens precisely when both these are integers. But both these are integers if t is an integer, and if t is an integer, both of these are an integer. So the only way this whole thing is an integer is precisely when t is an integer. So our integer solutions to this equation are precisely the points that look like this, where t is an integer. So we can write this as a set. It's a set of points like this, where t is an integer. And so we can see what our general theorem for this situation would look like. We'd have something like this. You pick a particular point that you get as a solution, which happens precisely if the GCD of these two divide this thing. Now, once you have this point, the rest of the solutions that are integers are shifts of this by values of t, where t is an integer, by this particular point here, 
which is obtained by dividing by the GCD and recording these numbers right over here. So let's actually write that as a theorem. We're not going to prove this as a theorem because the proof really just mimics the process that we saw right over here. Okay, so our theorem will state that if you have positive integers a and b, uh, suppose that you have a particular solution like this one to the equation ax plus by equals c, and here this is the linear Diophantine equation, then the full solution set looks like this. You take x0 and y0 in your coordinates, and then you augment the first one by an integer multiple of negative b over d, where d is the GCD of a and b, and here we augment by plus t times a over d. So you can give a try at proving this thing. It mimics the process that we employed right over here. And it's really cool that our intuition from what happens with lines in general gives us a good sense about how to go about this for a general linear Diophantine equation. Okay, great. Now we know how to solve these linear Diophantine equations in two variables. And that's a great step toward the RSA encryption algorithm that we're going to learn later. Now we're going to take a little bit of a dive away from this. One of the things that is important to understand for divisors in general is prime numbers. So in the next video, we're going to do some setup using mathematical induction before we actually dive into what primes are and properties of primes. So I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, please click the like button. And if you want to see more videos like this, subscribe to the channel.